Well, you know, my journalism professors at Seattle University, and that, that's a Jesuit school for anyone who cares, they told me, you know, you can't say when you're writing a game story under the inverted pyramid AP style that the refs decided the game. You know what? Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's true that refs decide the game. And, and you can say that that's whining, but just sometimes it's a point of fact that the refs really decided the game more than anybody else. Now, for the Utah fans listening here on The Voice of College Football, I wrote this over the weekend. I said it clearly. Cam Rising, Dalton Kincaid, man, they were monsters. They were super duper stars. And I would never walk up to their faces and tell them, oh, you didn't deserve this. Oh, you didn't earn it. They did. Like Utah still had to make the plays and Utah made them. So like Utah earned this. All right. And I can still say, on the other hand, the refs decided the game. Now, many people will say, oh, you can't hold those two positions at the same time. They're just incompatible. You, you, they're inherently contradictory. No, because luck is luck is a part of this. Human elements a part of this. And all that Utah could control was, you know, could it come back and, and win the game? Like it wasn't a sure thing that Utah was going to win, even with those calls. So Utah was able to get over the finish line. USC's defense wasn't able to close the deal. Utah earned it. But I can still say that the refs decided the game. And let's just use like a historical example. 1985 World Series. We, people of a certain age will remember Don Denkinger making the call at first base in the bottom of the ninth. Like the guy was out by a million feet. It was an awful call. And it's one out in the bottom of the ninth. Nobody on in game six. Cardinals two outs away. If that call is made correctly, Cardinals win the World Series. Almost certainly. All right. But. Dane Orge of the Royals still had to get that winning hit in the bottom of the ninth. The Royals still had to manufacture that run once they got that gift call. And then Brett Saberhagen had to pitch a great game seven to win the series. So you're not going to go up to Brett Saberhagen or Dane Orge or anybody else in the 85 Royals, Buddy Biancalana, Steve Balboni. You're not going to tell them, oh, you didn't earn it. They played a game seven and they played a great game seven and they won it. So like they did earn it, but Don Dankinger's call was the big, biggest single thing in that series. So you can have the, the, the view that Cam Rising, Dalton Kincaid, and that spectacular Utah offense earned the win, and they deserve all the praise that they're getting. And you can also say at the same time, the refs decided it. And why did the refs decide it? Let's go into that piece now. But before you run down the game, I just have to get this out because, Matt, you have the stage for the next however many minutes you want to take it as you take it through the play-by-play. -play. But I got to hit on two notes as a huge baseball historian myself and then also uh, taking the position that you do on this USC-Utah uh, game because I take the same position and I have been criticized. I take the position uh, that you just take uh, – took concerning the 2019 Ohio State Clemson college football playoff game, that there were horrendous calls that went against Ohio State, yet Clemson made the plays to win the game. They earned the win. Travis Etienne, Trevor Lawrence and company earning that win. However, horrendous calls throughout that game against Ohio State. And uh, boy, you start bringing up 1985 World Series. I could go on about Pat Sheridan and George Orta and bring up all these uh, other players that uh yeah ab absolutely so so don't get me started on baseball history matt we don't want to go there we could be like here that, all night yeah but that is a good clean representative example of how you can credit the winning team here and you can say the officials decided the game over here you can have those two things at the same time spiritual mystics will tell you <laughs> that life involves having con contradictory positions in tension now there are some there are some inherent contradictions that you can't hold at the same time but there are lots of contrasting positions you can hold at the same time so for utah fans you earned it you deserve it i never said otherwise and i wrote directly at trojans wire like cam rising and dalton kincaid they deserve everything they got they deserve to be happy they deserve to be victorious but yet you can also then come back and say to these usc kids who played so hard this was taken away from them all right now usc's pass rush struggled in this game and Utah's offensive line did a great job. That's a big reason why Utah won. Why is it then that the two times USC actually got to the quarterback on a big play, one to force an interception and then in the fourth quarter on a third and 10 and the refs basically flag them for playing flag football. 
that's horrible. Like these were huge misses. They weren't slight misses. And Utah fans would say, oh, but all these holding calls. I mean, there was a missed holding call in the end zone that would have been a safety. No argument about that. But with holding calls, look, there's holding on almost every play. And that's not excuse making. That's a reality because it's in a tangled mess of bodies. And let's take another take apart another piece about holding calls. You don't review them. They're not reviewable. All right. Roughing the passer like you have a full review replay architecture set up to break down this play and everybody gets to look at, oh, was this roughing? Oh, was it with the helmet? Oh, was it late? So we had several minutes to break this down. You don't, that doesn't apply to holding penalties. All right. This is different. It's a higher leverage play. If you, you know, if you can say in football that holding happens on just about every play, roughing the passer does not happen on just about every play. And it's just two people, the quarterback and the guy who hit the quarterback. And you're just looking at these two bodies and you have the replay system to break it all down to miss that. Not once, twice. All right. And the second time was not just, you know, the second time they admitted they were wrong because the original call was targeting. They rescind the targeting, but they still apply the penalty. And the vast majority of the time, over 90% for sure, don't have the exact numbers, but it's at least 90%. Like the, the, the amount of times that targeting is rescinded, but the 15-yard penalty is kept in place, very, very small percentage of the time. So if you're going to keep the penalty in place, and of course there are plays when you can do that, naturally the, the one kind of play that where you'd keep the penalty and it's, and it's obvious would be a late hit out of bounds because the hit's late. It's not targeting, but it's clearly late. So that's how you can keep the 15-yard penalty. This hit wasn't late. The, the, the guiding rule of thumb on late hits on quarterbacks, you get one step to the quarterback, not two. And this was not two. This was one step, one full step. And if you go boom, boom, two steps, and then hit him, that's a penalty. But that was not a penalty on USC by that, that one-step versus two-step principle. It was not by any means a late hit. So that this is really the overlooked aspect of that second call where they rescinded targeting but kept the 15-yard penalty in the fourth quarter. No discussion about the lateness of the hit because that the only way that's a penalty is if it's late, and it wasn't. And that that that's the specific detail that's being overlooked. So with holding penalties, you could you know say, oh, he missed that hold, he missed that hold. You know, he was looking at the left guard instead of the center. But that's kind of garden variety stuff. Those that's like a normal officiating miss doesn't necessarily make it acceptable but it's just a lot more commonplace and it is harder to look at a tangle of 10 bodies you know five linemen and five defensive linemen and or four defensive linemen and a linebacker 10 bodies in a closed space and you can say oh he missed it like that that's like a normal sight error but this was quarterback rusher and you get five minutes to look at it on replay and you rescind the targeting and you still keep the penalty like if you were to create a scenario in which the conspiracy theorists would run wild about, you know, USC getting it from the Pac-12 because it's out the door to the Big Ten, that's what it would look like. Like that would be the scenario that it would look like. We have five minutes to look over all the details of the play. Oh, we were wrong about the targeting, but we're still going to stick that 15-yard penalty in there for a hit which did not merit any sort of flag. And the other point to make, Brock Heward absolutely excoriated the officials for this. John Wilner tweeted out late Monday afternoon, early Monday evening, that that second call in the fourth quarter, the really high leverage call was awful. All right. So the experts think this was awful, not, not a slight miss, not a normal miss, like a holding call. This was a bad miss beyond the normal regular bounds. Like this was, this was an extremely bad miss call. This was like, Jim Joyce and the Andres Galarraga perfect game like this. This was e extremely bad. And because it happened in a high leverage situation and because USC's pass rush was bad in this game. And then the few times they get to Cam Rising and do something significant, you take it away from them. I think USC fans are justified to say that the refs took this away from USC. I don't think it's just crybaby whining. Because this play was higher leverage, and they had time to look at it, and they admitted they were wrong, and they left the 15-yard penalty in place. Now, that's a level of detail in terms of procedure, uh, in terms of process, that 
refs just simply trampled over that process and they decided to leave a penalty in place, which never should have been applied originally. You don't get that review process on a holding penalty. And I would say to Utah fans, I think we uh, that every penalty should be subject to review. Now, a lot of people are going to disagree with that. A lot of people are going to say, oh, we're going to have six hour games. And I get that. But if I was commissioner of college football, I would have a rule in place. You can challenge anything and you can challenge hold. You can get, you can get to challenge two holding calls per game that you want. So Utah would have been able to challenge the hold on USC in the end zone, which would have been a safety. You get to challenge two holding penalties per game. Um, but if you can't change the call in one minute, like every replay review should be on a one minute clock. And if you can't change it by then, then, then the play stands. And that's where the replay system breaks down. That's where faith in replay breaks down. We, we, you know, that that's kind of the undergirding problem here. Not, not just in terms of officials getting it wrong, but underlying it all replay taking 7 million years to, 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 to happen. If we could just have a, a regular one minute review system, then reviewing holding pass interference would be tolerable. It would be stomachable. But of course we know that that doesn't happen. And we know that they reviewed this play with USC Utah for several minutes and still didn't end up with the right result. So it's in from that larger context that I think the refs decided this game. They took a good play in a big situation away from USC, punishing the Trojans for honest effort and a clean hit on cam rising, you know, and it happened twice in the game affecting changes of possession. Like I think it's pretty honest and reasonable uh, to say that USC was hard done by the refs. Uh, but if you're a Utah fan and you and there were there were missed holding calls the other way, I get it. Like, I don't expect you to, to agree with me, okay? But I think the larger point, going back to the very beginning, is you can give Utah credit and you can say the refs really, really shafted USC in a unique way. You can have those two views at the same time. Life is complicated, everybody. I only have one question concerning the sequence with the roughing of the passer penalty involved in the in the same play as targeting, correct? Because I, I watched, uh, I saw about two thirds, three quarters of the game, but watching other games at the same time, Clemson, Florida State, et cetera. And then uh, the final quarter or so I was on here, so wasn't locked in on that. And uh, my apologies, everyone. I haven't gone back because I should do due diligence on every game in the country, but did not catch up with this one in regards to what I missed. So what I'm asking is the targeting is reviewable, but is the roughing the passer reviewable? Uh, it, it, it is, but here, but here's the thing there, there is a possibility and I don't know this for a fact, but there is a possibility. And uh, Tony Altamore mentioned this uh, on the Saturday USC post game show. Uh, he mentioned that it was it was roughing with targeting that could be interpreted as there was a roughing the passer penalty to begin with. And then there was targeting added on to it. And that that could be true. But this gets to an interpretation based reality in which, you know, let's go back to the uh, Music City Bowl uh, between Tennessee and Purdue uh, at the at the end of December. Remember on the goal line, Mark, um, yep. there was a situation in which, uh, you know, the Tennessee got, was ruled to have been stopped at yep. the goal line uh, in the fourth, you know, at the very end of the game. And Tennessee, you know, the play was not able to be overturned. Like he got into the end zone, uh, but the play was, was, was not overturned because the referee on the sideline viewed that forward progress was stopped. Not that per Purdue, um, you know, made made a tackle or that he'd never got to the goal line, but it was a view that forward progress was stopped. And so by saying that forward progress was stopped by rule, that prevented a review from taking place. Whereas if they had ma made the, the, the view that like the knee was down before getting to the goal line, breaking the plane of the ball, then they could review it. So that gets into a procedural point yep. where it, you just have to make the right basis for the ruling and if you make the right basis for the ruling then you allow for the review process to go forward it's a lot like blow uh, allowing a, a, a disputed fumble to run its course like you don't blow the whistle you allow the play to run its course sure. 
And that way you can allow the review mechanism uh, to step in. So that is part of the larger reality in terms of uh, the roughing with targeting and going into the nuances of that play. Uh, one thing that wasn't specified was precisely that, you know, the, the, the targeting, you know, what, what constituted the penalty if it wasn't targeting? Like, did he say late hit? Did he say, you know, leading with the helmet? Uh, th things like that. That was never specified. And so that kind of leaves us in the dark uh, on targeting and whether the roughing component was able to be rescinded as well as the targeting. But like that, that is, that's kind of like a, a procedural matter it, because they never really explained what the roughing penalty was removed from targeting. We, we were all left in the dark on that. So that's kind of the procedural okay. explanation there.